Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all of you. It's a great pleasure to be here at the Emanuel Center this evening to welcome one of our most popular exports, who we have been, in a sense, privileged to send over to the United States, but to bring back on regular occasions to talk to us about history. And that is, of course, Professor Neil Ferguson, currently of Stanford University, but recently of the parishes of Harvard and New York as well. You will know, of course, that Neil Ferguson has written on a variety of topics, many of them with very punchy one-word theses to start with. Civilization, empire, colossus, and then the big names of the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, Rothschild, Warburg, and of course, Kissinger, uh, the biography of whom uh, Neil is currently in the middle of, uh, of writing. But he has today come to us to talk about a rather different set of ideas in his new book, The Square and the Tower, which is subtitled Networks, Hierarchies, and the Struggle for Global Power. And I was struck by a story that you tell quite early on in the book, Neil, in which you say that you were, to some extent, put onto this topic by a realization, perhaps at a certain age and a certain stage in the academic career, that you were extraordinarily well connected and networked, but that you felt that as an Ivy League professor, you still had no real power. Now, as an academic myself, I can sympathize with having no power, even though I can't claim to be in any way well networked. But I'm sure that wasn't the only reason that you chose to write this book. What was the reason that this particular topic um, took you up so strongly? Well, first of all, can I just say what a pleasure it is to be back here uh, on this stage where I think two years ago, Andrew Roberts and I were talking about the first volume of the Kissinger biography. It was partly writing that biography that made me think about networks in a more systematic way than I'd ever done before. Uh, we might talk about this later, Rana, but I have a hypothesis for volume two of Kissinger, which is that he went from being a Harvard professor to being at one time perhaps the most influential, perhaps the most powerful man in the world in the 1970s, through his network. And uh, the hypothesis that his network really mattered is one that I've vaguely, slightly tested out in this book. So I was thinking about networks. Uh, then, of course, I moved to Stanford just about a, a year ago. And if you want to think about modern networks, the ones made possible by the technology of the internet, there's, there's really no better place. And I should tell you a somewhat discomforting tale. When I arrived uh, at Stanford and started talking to people in Silicon Valley, which is right next door, about what I do, they kind of looked quite bored. <laughs> Surely not. And, and, you know, the guys in the T-shirts were like looking at their phones and their the, the uh, Apple Watches, and I realized that for these people, history began with the Google IPO, uh, or, or maybe the founding of Facebook, and all the stuff that I was interested in was essentially the Stone Age, as far as they were concerned. And so I would kind of try these conversations out, you know, there's a lot that you could learn from, that kind of thing, and people would look completely zoned out. Uh, so I, I was motivated to write the book partly by a sense that Silicon Valley had the Henry Ford theory of history, namely that history is bunk, irrelevant to them, they had nothing to learn from it, because their technology was so awesome, what could possibly stand in its way? So the book was both partly motivated, I think, by a desire to think through hypotheses about networks, but maybe more motivated by a desire to show Silicon Valley that history applies to them just as much as it applied to Wall Street 10 years ago when I was writing The Ascent of Money. May I ask, Neil, if that's what's behind the uh, rather broad claim on the back of the book where it says, what no, if no, everything we thought should, about history was wrong? Nobody should ever be held responsible for what is on the back of his book <laughs> any more than one should be held responsible for the headline that's put above one's articles in the newspaper. You know that, Rana. Well, in that case, we won't hold responsible. A man is not under oath when he signs off on the blurb on the dust jacket. Well, in that case, Neil, we won't hold you to the quote uh, from someone else in The Guardian that you're far too glamorous to be an academic. We'll take that as being part well, of that. Well, it's a low bar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Touché. Very much touché. Let's get to 
the idea, and it is a big idea, that underpins the book. And it's not just about networks. We've been using this term quite a bit already, and I think we want to dig into it more deeply. But also about the contrast between that and hierarchy. And the point that you make quite early on, and you push very hard, is that historians as a profession, broadly speaking, have been looking at history through one particular framework too much, and another framework not enough. Would that be right? I think that is right. Of, of course, we, we need to be nuanced here. But broadly speaking, hierarchical structures like states or armies or corporations have attracted a disproportionate amount of attention from the historical profession, and you can see why that would happen. One characteristic feature of large hierarchical structures is that there's usually a, an archives department. Uh, you know, a state, even a relatively small state, even a relatively poor state, uh, has an archive, and that is where historians tend to converge. Uh, even those historians who set out to write social history or history from below, and a whole generation, maybe two generations of historians have tried to do that, usually ended up in the archives whether they liked it or not. Uh, Richard Evans, who was a pioneer of social history and labor history, uh, ended up writing the history of cholera in Hamburg from the archives of the Hamburg state. So, the problem with that approach is that you're tending to overlook the much more informal structures, which I'm calling networks for short, but should really call distributed networks, informal organizations that are less likely to keep detailed records of their activities, or if they do, less likely to keep them in one place. So I think there's a bias in historiography, broadly speaking, over not just the last 20 years, but the last 200 years, in favor of states and the people who run states, or even just the people who are governed by states, and too little attention has been paid uh, to networks. And the problem, which is a really important one, is that that has left the field of network history to the conspiracy theorists. Uh, to illustrate this point, when you uh, go home, Google the Illuminati, uh, or for that matter, the Rothschilds. I think some people are doing it right now, in fact, here in the hall. You're not allowed to Google while we're talking. Uh, <laughs> put those devices away at once. But the, the Illuminati are a great example of a network that for many years eluded serious scholarship. I mean, would you say this, this, is, this is a sort of idea that in the 18th century a variety of largely enlightenment figures came together in a massive conspiracy to try and control the world and their influence in this conspiracy theory has supposedly lasted for the 200 years ever since? This, this is one of the most potent conspiracy theories out there, has found its way into the literature of such luminaries as Dan Brown. I think they're in the Da Vinci Code. Uh, but it's much worse. When you, when you get into the websites that purport to tell the history of the Illuminati, you enter the strange parallel world of conspiracy theory, which we as academics are sort of repelled by. We, we don't really want to go anywhere near those people because they're so disreputable. But that means we slightly leave the Illuminati and other similar organizations, say the Freemasons, in the hands of the conspiracy theorists. I mean, I can remember John Roberts at Oxford saying you couldn't write the history of secret societies in the 19th century. You could only write the history of what people had said about them. And that meant that all these different network-type organizations were written about in an entirely lurid style, going right back to the late 18th century, so which blamed them for everything. You know, uh, you, you name it, there's a literature that blames the Illuminati for it, or if not the Illuminati, the Rothschilds, and if not the so Rothschilds, the Bilderberg So let's not, let's not indulge in any conspiracy theories, but let's say, you know, supposing we were, frankly, rather large seminar group working with Professor Ferguson at Stanford, and you've just made that point, isn't the first thing that someone's going to come back to you, if they're training to be a historian, to say, well, it's all very well to make this critique, there's a great deal to it, but what is it in terms of sources and methodologies we should be using to uncover this hidden history? Surely the point about that history is that it is hard to recover, and that's why people haven't written it. Uh, hard, but not impossible. Uh, in recent years, a tremendous uh, group of scholars in Germany have written a serious history of the Illuminati, which did exist. There really was a radical enlightenment secret order uh, founded in the 1770s, designed to promote the ideas of the more radical parts of the Enlightenment. And it 
its strategy was to penetrate the existing structure of Masonic lodges. They were kind of uh, infiltrating Freemasonry. Now, the, the lodges turn out to have quite extensive records oh, but relating to the but, society. But Neil, then you're basically saying we're going back to a different sort of institution and their archives. That's more a question of looking harder for archives rather than a, a different method. Well, I, I think it is that because clearly you can't do anything without some source material. The characteristic feature of network organisations is that there is source material, but it's very widely dispersed because it's a network. Another good example, which is actually going on at Stanford right now, is the way in which the Enlightenment itself can be understood as a network phenomenon. How do you do that? Well, you look at the networks of correspondence and publication through which Enlightenment ideas spread. Uh, and this uh, is, has really become quite an ambitious project, in effect, to graph or map the intellectual revolution of the uh, 18th century. And in the book, I, I actually depict one of the products of this enterprise, a map of Voltaire's correspondence. I got quite excited by this tool because you can, in fact, plot all kinds of graphs showing how exactly the great intellectuals of the 18th century communicated their ideas to one another. So it is doable to write the history of networks, but you need somewhat different techniques. And I want to go to a very specific example in a minute, and possibly one of the most important ones in the book, but just to drive the point home, again, if we were sitting amongst your historical colleagues, your historian colleagues at Stanford or Harvard or elsewhere, wouldn't they tap you on the knee and say, Neil, in the end, what you're describing actually is the kind of social history that people have been doing for decades now. They're talking about trade unions forming before the trade unions existed, suffragettes moving together illegally and not being able to record what they do. These are, in the end, the sorts of histories of people who haven't left behind an archival record, but which people have been reconstructing through oral histories, through other sorts of sources, for some time. Is there really anything different here? Yes, there is, because uh, although there were all kinds of efforts in that direction going back decades, uh, no historians until very recently understood the first thing about network science, about the theory of networks. And until you have some theoretical framework to think about a network, it's just a term you use casually. And everybody in this room will have said uh, that they have been networking at some point in their lives. We started using it as a, as a verb back in the 1980s. But in fact, there is a complex and sophisticated theoretical framework for understanding networks, including the network in this room. So we could actually graph the network of people in this room with a relatively small amount of data from each of you, and we could work out the structure of the network. We could work out who was most closely connected with whom. We could work out who was the best connected person. We could use measures like betweenness centrality to figure out which person in this room, in fact, was the most important hub uh, of the network. Of course, it's me, but uh, I, I think that's but technically apart from me, six degrees of Neil Ferguson. This is a this is a three point five seven degrees. It turns out because it's no no longer six degrees of separation. So the problem with a lot of what you just talked about as social history is that unwittingly historians were writing about networks. I used to do this. I would talk about networks when I was writing the Rothschild book. I would say, well, there was a network of agents, of correspondents, and so forth, but I didn't realize that I was failing to analyze the network structure. And so a really big part of the motivation for this book was to say to my fellow historians, people, you've been writing about networks without understanding how they work, without using the tools of analysis that you need. It's not enough to write social history and then say, oh, well, they were the proletariat, uh, they were the bourgeoisie, and I suppose that must have been the aristocracy, which is essentially what social historians inspired by Marx did for several generations. No, it's much more interesting than that. What's really fascinating is when you start understanding the distinctive properties of social networks through the ages, the fact that their structure is not that of a lattice, the people in this room are not all uniformly connected a little bit to one another, any group of people will turn out to have a really quite complex network 
structure. And that's what the book tries to do. Very few historians have got that. Uh, in fact, the, the, there's a small and growing generation of people working in this kind of way, drawing on these ideas which come not just from, uh, from social science, but also from the natural sciences. You know, neural networks are an important part of where we get network theory from. Even physics has made a major contribution. Almost the best book I read about networks was by a man called Laszlo Barabasi. Brilliant book. Um, that's the stuff that historians haven't really paid any attention to. Well, we shall now turn, I think, to a very specific example. It's one of the most important ones in your book. And that comes from the early modern period, about 400 years ago, around the era of the Reformation. And just a reminder, of course, that the Reformation is very much on our minds uh, in the current year because it's 500 years since Martin Luther basically put, pinned up his precepts on uh, a, uh, a church door, opening the great rift in European Catholicism and bringing, out, bringing about what we now think of as the birth of Protestantism. Along with that comes a variety of changes both in message and technology. And Neil, your book does a great deal to argue that the Reformation and the technological and social and religious revolution that comes with it is actually a really important period in terms of networks. Yeah, there's some terrific work on this, uh, which shows the ways in which the advent of the printing press uh, in the 15th century uh, set into motion uh, what became one of the great uh, intellectual or religious revolutions uh, of uh, all time, the Reformation. Uh, if Martin Luther had did what he did uh, uh, in 1517 uh, without the printing press, he would have been just another obscure, char-grilled heretic. But because, because Luther very quickly was able to get his message out about what was wrong with the, the Roman Catholic hierarchy through this amazing network of printing presses all over Northwestern Europe, uh, they could not stop Luther going viral. And this is a really important uh, insight. There haven't been many periods in history why, when established hierarchical structures have really been overwhelmed by a network phenomenon. It was really difficult to do uh, in any previous century, but the printing press allows Luther's message to spread with astonishing speed. Now, there's a very good uh, paper which I cite in the book by a man named Dittmar, who compares the ways in which printing led to a dramatic decline in the cost of a page uh, and a dramatic growth in the volume of books produced. Uh, and this is very similar in its shape to what you get when you map uh, the personal computer's uh, explosive growth in our time. And the analogy, I think, holds very good. Broadly speaking, what I argue is there have been two great ages of network disruption empowered by new technology. One really starts in 1517, and the other gets going in our own time in the 1970s with the birth and, and rapid growth of the internet and the personal computer. That's really a critical argument in the book because only by reassessing the Reformation as a network-driven phenomenon can we begin to understand the implications of our own network revolution. And I'll just mention a, a couple to illustrate why this really matters. Luther thought that if he could only get everybody to read the Bible in their native tongue, in the vernacular, they would have an immediate relationship to God that would no longer be mediated by a corrupt clergy and everything would be awesome, as they now say in Silicon Valley. There would be a priesthood of all believers, uh, we would all be uh, Christians together, uh, problem solved. This is so like what people in Silicon Valley have been saying for years would happen if everybody was connected. In a planet where everything is connected, there will be, you can ask Mark Zuckerberg about this, a global community. And that vision of a global community suddenly struck me as just the same as Martin Luther's vision of a priesthood of all believers, except that it doesn't turn out that way. Once you connected everybody in Northwestern Europe to Luther's vision of reformation, what happened? No, not a general agreement that he was a good guy, dramatic polarization. Some people say, yes, you're right, we're with you. In fact, we want to go further than you. 
this guy Calvin has the right idea. And then a whole bunch of other people said, no, absolutely no way, let's do the counter-reformation. And so Europe goes very rapidly into a state of, of polarization, and in this polarized environment, conflict escalates, and you end up with about 130 years of religious war. So that analogy seems to me to be a really powerful one as we try to understand the polarization of our own time and this tendency for stuff to go viral, not all of it good. Neil, we'll get in a very short time to the question of whether or not we're going to face 130 years of warfare in our own period, and I think everyone here will be very pleased to know what your answer is to that uh, question. <laughs> Sticking with Luther's time for a little longer, you mentioned various things including the use of the printing press and the technology to spread the Bible, and of course the use of the vernacular Bible in local languages, in English, in German, in French, and so forth, um, was an important part of that. But isn't another important part of the networking the shared use of language? This is also a time when there is a commonality of the use of Latin in this particular case. I think also about a part of the world on which I work in terms of history, and that's China, where of course we'd like to point out that printing was invented rather earlier than it was in, in Europe. And you also have there a I large... I do acknowledge that in the book, though. Absolutely so. And China is something we'll also come, come back to. But thinking about sort of the parallel period, you also have there the spread of commercial and merchant culture because of the ability to print and pass out these, um, uh, these messages, whether they're commercial or religious. Buddhist texts are an example of that too. So how important is shared language as a driver, as a motor for your network mechanism? Well, it's, it's hugely important. One can see that today if one graphs the, the world's online networks, there really are two. Uh, one is essentially uh, an English-based network, which is run by network platforms based uh, on the west coast of the United States, and the other is a Chinese uh, network, and they're really quite separate now because the Chinese built their own network platforms. Uh, and there, there is remarkably little communication across uh, the borders, there's some, but, but not, not uh, anything like as much as there would be if we all spoke uh, and used English. And that also comes in, 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 into the case of the uh, Enlightenment, where uh, there is a, a global conversation going on in, in French and English, and those people who are in that conversation can use both those languages. So I, I think language is, is crucial. You can't have a network uh, which is uh, going to succeed that is, that is polyglot. That's really hard to manage. And one of the things that actually is an interesting contraindication in your book when you talk about the Enlightenment is that you point out that some of the networks of knowledge, and I think you were thinking there of the Scottish Enlightenment, these are thinkers like David Hume in the early 18th century who put forward a whole variety of social and economic ideas. Actually, when you do one of these fascinating graphs that turn up over and over again in the book, they have quite small networks of connection compared to some of the other ones you've talked about. That's right. Uh, my heroes are really the great Scottish thinkers of the Enlightenment, and uh, they turn out not to have been anything like as cosmopolitan in their reach as, say, Voltaire. Uh, and so I think one begins to realize that the Enlightenment wasn't quite as, uh, as global or cosmopolitan a phenomenon as we had thought. A lot of these networks turn out to be quite clustered in, in national communities. Most of Voltaire's correspondents were, in fact, French. And yet, we do have from somewhere coming out this idea that the Enlightenment does change the way that we think about ideas of rationality, about secularism, about the way the world works. The Enlightenment still stands as this period of the 18th century when European thinkers recast almost a sort of post-religious world. So if it's not networks doing that, what is the mechanism that enables that particular period to be ultimately influential and successful? Well, the way I would think about this is that Luther had begun a succession of network-driven revolutions. Uh, Luther himself understood that once you could print the Bible, you could print anything. Uh, he, even, he even argued that the Koran should be printed in German. He, he was uh, against its suppression, arguing that if it was printed, then people could see the error uh, of, uh, of Islam. This was a, a remarkably uh, bold thing for somebody to say in the 16th century. Uh, 
the, the scientific revolution didn't take long to happen. It was the next great intellectual revolution, clearly driven by an international network. Uh, the Enlightenment, I think, follows the same pattern. You can be Benjamin Franklin in Philadelphia and be plugged into a conversation about ideas that is happening in Paris and in Edinburgh. And the Industrial Revolution, the rather less glamorous but economically much more important revolution that began uh, in the British Isles, had the same character, although it involved quite different people. I'd say there was a kind of era of network revolutions that culminated in the political revolutions in the American colonies and in France. Uh, and that was the sort of high point of that networked era that had begun in 1517. But in a way, the networks overreached. Ideas of liberty that worked pretty well in the American colonies worked pretty badly in the case of France which plunged into a kind of bloody anarchy near civil war in the 1790s. So in the book, there's a really crucial turning point, which is Napoleon. Uh, Napoleon is a hierarchical figure who says, the only way we sort out this mess is that I control everything. And Andrew, uh, who was here two years ago, has done such a terrific work, job on Napoleon's biography, a wonderful biography, showing what a control freak Napoleon is. And Napoleon's attitude is, the only way we fix this is if I make every decision right down to but the colour of the soldiers. Hang on, surely the answer to that, and I imagine there may be some Napoleon fans in the audience who'd like to speak up for him during Q&A, is that amongst other things, yes, he conquers large parts of Europe, but he also introduces the Code Napoleon. In other words, shared ideas of law, shared ideas of understanding how bureaucracy and rationality work that help create the mechanisms by which a network could operate. In other words, people can talk to each other in literally the same language because of Napoleon. Surely that helps, not hinders the network. But let's not get too fixated on the ideas. The network structure is as important as the content of any idea passing through the network. That's a really crucial point. Why do things go viral? Most people instinctively assume it's because they're just really cool things. Uh, they're really kind of inherently attractive and interesting. But it turns out to be the case that perfectly interesting and attractive things don't go viral, and really bad things, really unpleasant things can go viral. Witchcraft went viral, as well as the scientific revolution. Keith Thomas showed that many years ago. And that's because network structure is really crucial. It's as much the structure of the network that an idea or for that matter, an actual virus attacks that determines how far and how fast it spreads. Uh, what essentially Napoleon said was, these ideas are all very well and good, but the structure's gone haywire. We need to restructure France so that one person, me, is in complete control. Uh, and that was the essence of the Napoleonic project, enlightenment despotism. Uh, and I think that seems to me like an enormous turning point uh, in historical development. The assertion that human society in fact does need a strong authoritarian and hierarchical structure in order to function. And I'd say for the next 200 or so years, that's a very powerful, attractive ideas, a attractive proposition that leads to the emergence of ever more centralized states. So hierarchy basically wins somewhere around about 1800 and becomes the dominant structural form right the way through the 19th and into the middle of the 20th century. And that brings us in a little while to the subject of China, which of course shows very interesting characteristics of both the hierarchy and the network. But before we get there, let me take up another thought that's driven by your mention of Napoleon. And that's the link between hierarchies, networks and power. And that, I think, inexorably brings us to Henry Kissinger. You spent probably more time than anyone uh, in the academy examining the life of Henry Kissinger in detail. And so you're uniquely qualified to talk about him. In the chapter on Kissinger in your book, you talk about the way in which you come to discover that you think that essentially he's possibly the most, not necessarily the most powerful, but the most networked figure in modern politics that there has been or ever will be. Why that? Why is that? Well, this has to do with what happened in the 1970s. If you think about what I said a minute ago, the Napoleonic notion of one man in total control keeps on repeating itself right the way down to the middle of the 20th century 
when you have the ultimate expression of hierarchical power in the totalitarian states, uh, the Third Reich, the Soviet Union, and Mao's People Republic, People's Republic of China. Uh, Stalin is so completely controlling that he knows every telephone conversation that is going on, and when he hears that Isaiah Berlin has play, paid a visit on the poet Anna Akhmatova, uh, he persecutes her and her family as punishment. In the Soviet Union, there is no social network possible that is not authorized by the state. By the 1970s, the great hierarchical states that had emerged in the mid-20th century were beginning to fragment. Uh, they fragmented in a bunch of ways. Uh, the United States found it couldn't win a war in Vietnam and plunged into a social and cultural crisis which Americans are reliving thank to, thanks to Ken Burns' documentary right now. The 1970s is also the time that the Defense Department so preoccupied with the mess in Vietnam and much else that it just kind of leaves these guys on the West Coast to build something called ARPANET, which is the beginning of the internet, and do whatever they like with it. There's, there's no central control over the innovations that produce the internet. The Soviets have a project for an internet, but it's shut down by the finance ministry. So this is the scene into which Henry Kissinger enters. Kissinger, who had been an academic, was not a promising figure in the beginning of the Nixon administration. Most people assumed, like the aging, uh, indeed dying, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, that he would be at best a cipher for Nixon. Within a few short so years... So just say, this is in 1969, he comes in as national security advisor to newly elected Republican President Richard Nixon. Within three or four years, the world generally agrees that Super K, and that's how he's represented on the cover of news magazines, is the most powerful, indeed the indispensable man. That phrase was used in a Time profile. And I try to show in this book, and I'll show it again, I think, in volume two of the biography, that that's because Kissinger understood that the age of hierarchy was waning. It didn't really matter where you were in the org chart, you know, the organization chart that says the president's there and the national security advisor is there, but the secretary of state is actually above him. Kissinger didn't care about the org chart. He despised bureaucracy and had done since he was a young man. Kissinger realized that real influence, and maybe ultimately power too, came from your network. And that is why he compulsively lunches with journalists, even hangs out with people in TV and movies, and builds a network that's ultimately global. For me, the key insight was that one could actually graph that network and establish, not just journalistically, but rigorously, that he was the most important node in the network. That word node is crucial. You're all nodes. I'm a node, Rana's a node. The relationship between Nana, uh, Rana and me is an edge. Uh, that, that's essentially the- Not the, a sharp the, one, the, I hope. It's a quite soft edge of, you know, mutual academic respect and degree of political hostility on Rana's side, I imagine. <laughs> because all Oxford dons think I'm a kind of wild-eyed conservative. We're, we're just jealous, Neil, we're just jealous. There is that. Um, <laughs> so Kissinger, you can show that Kissinger was the indispensable man, and I've done it in the book with the help of a brilliant student of mine, Manny Rincon. We've graphed the Nixon and Ford administrations. We looked at all the ways in which the, the people within the administrations interacted and found that, yes, he really was, after Nixon, by far the most important person in those administrations. So I think it's a very useful tool. And to go back to something we were saying earlier, other historians need to make use of this kind of thing because it's very revealing once you formally graph a network. It can often turn out that the person you thought was really important wasn't that important. Uh, and I give the example of the American Revolution to back that up. Uh, there's a lovely paper. If you're interested in the American Revolution, there are probably some Americans here tonight. It's a great story, uh, but the story we tend to tell uh, gives enormous importance to, to Washington, Jefferson, and of course, since the musical, Alexander Hamilton. But Paul Revere was way more important. Paul Revere and Joseph Warren were the key people in the network that made that revolution happen. 
Paul, Paul only Revere show that. was the man who famously made the ride from Lexington to Concord and was a sort of key figure, and remains an iconic figure of the American Revolution. Absolutely. And, and the connectedness of Revere is something that we can graph. Moreover, it turns out to be crucial that these key nodes in the revolutionary network were Freemasons. They were already in uh, a pre-existing network. So that's the kind of thing that I find really fascinating, uh, and it's the kind of thing that you won't find in most history books of the revolution. Uh, okay, but let's stick with Henry Kissinger for a moment, Neil, because while I'm willing to absolutely admit my jealousy of you, I think all dons are much more jealous of Henry Kissinger, who managed to make it from the <laughs> academy to, uh, to world domination. Because you talk about the way in which the world was changing that enabled him to create that network. But the fact is that the people who came afterwards, Cyrus Vance, George Schultz, uh, you know, uh, Lawrence Eagleburger, other secretaries of state, they were distinguished people, they had networks of their own. And yet the fact is that Henry Kissinger has not been in a formal American government office since 1977. And yet when anyone mentions a secretary of state, an American diplomat. Kissinger is even now at the age of 94, top of the list. So there must be something distinctive about him. It can't just be the changing tenor of the times or other people would have been able to do that too. I think that's a great observation. Rana, you know China better than me. He's still the most revered Western figure that's correct. there, uh, even more than Mark Zuckerberg. A uh, little bit more. <laughs> Xi Jinping will... Uh, invite him to come for private one-on-one -on -one meetings. Putin, too. Uh, it's extraordinary the extent to which a man in his 90s uh, is still turned to at critical junctures, such as followed the election of Donald Trump, which took most international uh, observers by surprise. And I think it would be wrong for me to go to the other extreme and say it's all about network structure. It's also the fact that in his relationships, Kissinger has this uncanny ability almost to mind meld, to get inside the psychology and even the history of the person that he's sitting opposite. And this is something I did write about in, in volume one. This ability to put yourself empathetically in the other person's shoes is a very powerful uh, skill that he has. And when you look at the relationships in his memoirs, for example, that he mentions most frequently, they're with people, they're with people from completely different worlds. Anwar Sadat, uh, Chou Enlai. These were the people that he formed very strong relationships. Or the Soviet ambassador, Dobrynin. So I think in the end, uh, the key to, to Kissinger's network was not how many shuttle diplomacy flights did he take, I think John Kerry and Hillary Clinton mm. thought that was the key, so they would always boast about how many countries they'd been to. No, it wasn't the air miles that mattered. It was the way in which he built relationships. And I suppose the more I've reflected on this, the more I've realized that the study of networks is the systematic study of relationships. And it's the recognition that in any organization, any institution, there really are two maps there's the org chart, which tells you who you report to and who reports to you. And then there's the network, which is the real map. Uh, and people who work in organizational behavior, some of them at Stanford Graduate School of Business, routinely do this for companies. They'll go in and they'll say, you think you're in charge, we'll show you who's really in charge. Uh, so I, I think Kissinger was somebody who grasped that. The network's more important than the org chart. And I think that's generally true. You've talked about the way in which different sorts of hierarchy and different sorts of network have emerged from the 1970s in an age when, again, technology changes very considerably. You mentioned the ARPANET, which, of course, is the a predecessor of what we now think of as the World Wide Web and the, the Internet. And we now live in a time when what some people have called FANG is dominant. And that stands for Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. I have to say I have some doubts, and no disrespect to anyone from Netflix here, that Netflix may be in the list because it makes the abbreviation actually sound rather more, uh, uh, more pronounceable. But yeah. nonetheless, let's include them in that group. You, you can have Gaffer if you prefer and, and, and add Apple in, which is better. The European Commission likes Gaffer, but it, it doesn't work as well. On as the other fact. hand, the European Commission doesn't like any of these organizations like any ter right. terribly much. <laughs> but the question comes in, these were organizations that started off, you mentioned Mark Zuckerberg, chief executive of Facebook, wearing the T-shirt, you know, everyone's wearing their baseball caps, um, looking very, very casual in Silicon Valley, making millions of dollars. These are 
supposed networks, social networks, that actually are the new hierarchies, aren't they? Well, that's the paradox. I mean, in the end, let's be clear, a hierarchy is just a kind of network. This is not a dichotomy that you should attach too much importance to. A hierarchy is just a network where key edges are missing that force most nodes to go through a central node, whatever it is they want. And a network, a distributed network, is one where there are more edges and there are no such obviously dominant nodes. So just to get that clear. That means that the paradox is, in fact, resolved by network science. If you create a giant network with two billion people, which is what Mark Zuckerberg has done, more than two billion people now are on Facebook, half, more than half, the entire population of the United Kingdom are regular Facebook users on the Facebook page once a month minimum. If you do that, you're not creating a lattice-like structure in which everybody is just a netizen equally sharing ideas and posting thoughts and liking stuff. No, the actual network structure is profoundly unequal. Because in almost all social networks, there is this extraordinary phenomenon of preferential attachment. When people join the network, when new people join, they want to be connected to some nodes much more than others. They want to be connected to the nodes that are already really well connected. So all large social networks are characterized by, in fact, a hierarchical structure. Donald Trump has way more Twitter followers than any of us. Not just a lot more, just orders of magnitude more than most people in this room. And that's the characteristic feature of social networks, and it becomes more striking the bigger they get. But, so but in, but so that's that, part one of my answer, but oh, part just, two... But just, just on that, Neil, isn't, wouldn't it be the case in any modern era, though, that the President of the United States would, say, get millions more people watching him on television than would be the case with even you, as you appear on television, or me, who hardly ever does? Um, you know, is there any order of magnitude of difference in terms of the quality of that network as opposed to just simply being someone who people pay a lot of attention to? Well, these are a very... It's a very different technology. In the end, television networks were centrally controlled. There was a very finite amount of programming that you could watch, say, during the Nixon uh, presidency. Uh, our networks are not like that. Uh, there, there isn't, in fact, central control over what is posted on Facebook. And that's part of Mark unless Zuckerberg's you're in Moscow. problem. Well, unless you're, an, or, or for that matter, in China, where there is actually some kind of uh, effective uh, system of state censorship. What happens with these networks is far more spontaneous. All those two billion people are posting stuff and liking stuff. And it is that as it's a spontaneous outcome of those collective actions that produces what we see online. Algorithms decide uh, what is going to feature most prominently, not people. And that's a very different thing from the big television networks uh, of the mid uh, and late 20th century. The second part of my answer, which is really crucial, is that unlike the great networks created by the printing press, the networks created by the personal computer, the smartphone, and the internet are very concentrated in their ownership. Johannes Gutenberg did not become a billionaire. In fact, he was bankrupt at one point and ended his life on a state pension. The people who built the social networks of our time have become billionaires. They own the networks. You just use them. And this is a very, very important difference between our time and that time. In our second network age, if you'll forgive me calling it that, the network heightens the inequalities that already exist in our societies. The richest men in the world and their men, are increasingly the people who own the infrastructure and the, the networks that exist on the platforms uh, of the internet and the World Wide Web. And this is an astonishing state of affairs because it has created a new hierarchy. As you rightly say, Rana, this is a critical argument of the book. There's a new hierarchy in town, and it's the hierarchy of Silicon Valley. To, to the people who run these companies, there is an astonishing sense of power. 
But in the last 12 months, there's been a realization that, as they say in the Spider-Man movies, with great power comes great responsibility and a great deal of trouble, too, if you don't know how to manage that responsibility. Of, so, course, of course, Neil, most of those, if probably all, almost all of those Silicon Valley internet billionaires would have preferred Hillary Clinton to become president of the United States, and she didn't. So to their utter horror, and it really was, uh, it was really kind of fascinating to watch up close, they found that the network platforms they'd created could be used to achieve the opposite of what they had intended. It was not the Clinton, uh, the Clinton campaign that knew how to use Facebook to target advertising in order to secure the swing states. It was the Trump campaign. It was Steve Bannon and Jared Kushner. Not to mention Russian intelligence. We are in the midst of a great expose, which is not over, that is going to reveal the extent to which Trump campaign in a large way and the Russian intelligence network in a small way used Facebook and to a lesser extent other platforms to achieve victory in the 2016 presidential election. And I argue in the book, and I stand by it, that Donald Trump would not be president today if there had not been Facebook and Twitter uh, and the other platforms that were used. Uh, in a conventional, traditional American election campaign, he would have been defeated because he would have been outspent. Hillary Clinton outspent Donald Trump two to one, more than two to one. Uh, on standard cable and terrestrial television advertising, he would have lost. So this was a hugely significant moment in American political history. I still don't think people realize the extent to which it depended on the use uh, of Facebook in particular. Well, I think the realization in the wider sense of the power is one of the reasons why the one market, if you want to call it that, I think it is a market in the world that doesn't fully conform to this, of course, is China. And there you have an internet netizen population that is now about twice the population of the United States as a whole, about 600 million and growing. There are indeed big dominant companies there, Tencent, Alibaba, Baidu. But these companies are very much hand in glove with the Chinese Communist Party and make no particular secret of it. It's not uh, something that they would, I think, be ashamed of. Is that going to be the alternative model of how the network society changes, one where an authoritarian state not only is not subverted by it, but actually co-opts it. Oh, I think that's right. And in, in the book, I, I venture into your territory, Rana, by writing about what's happened in China, where Fang has failed to get its uh, teeth into the market, uh, despite every effort. I mean, Facebook uh, has tried, Google has tried, they have all struggled, and ultimately, Uber's the most recent uh, uh, case. They've been rebuffed. And in their place, the Chinese have built their own giant internet companies. Uh, the bat has beaten the fang, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. This means that there's a parallel, I mentioned it earlier, a parallel world of social networks, which is the Chinese world, that is not closely connected because there's a great firewall of China around it, to the rest of the world, which is essentially Silicon Valley's. This is enormously important. Because, it, because, as you say, Rana, there is an intimate relationship between the Communist Party and the giant network platforms, there is a unique opportunity here for a government, a system of government that many people thought was on borrowed time, certainly in 1989, to consolidate its power. Because never in history has a government had such access to the data of its citizens as the Chinese government now has. Uh, it, it is uh, something that uh, even the most dystopian visions of the mid-20th century didn't approximate to. Now, we shall see what comes of it, but my strong impression is that the Chinese were strategically brilliant to see the threat posed by Silicon Valley and to understand that they could co-opt these technologies to strengthen their power. Well, in a moment, we're going to go to our audience, so I sure have a great deal they want to bring to the discussion. But let me end, if I may, with a question that comes from what you've just said, but goes back to the question of the wider historical framework that the book operates in. Because when it's all said and done, and I mean this as a supreme compliment, you are best known as a historian and a historian you know, who thinks big. A lot of history, perhaps sometimes artificially, has been thought of as 
dichotomies. So Reformation period, Catholics versus Protestants in Europe. Uh, in the 20th century, the Cold War, the communist world versus the capitalist world. Are we seeing the beginning, right now really, the early 21st century, of a world in which there may be essentially two technologically enabled networks, one which is broadly the, quotes, liberal capitalist world driven by the United States, but not wholly of the United States, and then one which is essentially defined by what the Chinese are doing. And will we see that dichotomy, that relationship but separation, operate for years or indeed decades to come as a new historical framework? It's possible, but one thing that's very clear is that Europe has a different vision of its future. Uh, the European Commission has become increasingly aggressive in not only taxing, uh, but regulating the big American companies. That is a battle that is already underway. And there will be another battle coming soon, which will be the battle between the Trump administration and Washington more generally, mm. and Silicon Valley. So I think only the Chinese have really resolved the tension between the network platforms, the, the new networks, uh, and their new hierarchy, and the established hierarchies of the mid-20th century states. And I'm more interested, in, at least in the short run, in how those dis, uh, divisions within the Western world get resolved. Because it's not clear to me who wins in the United States. Is it going to be Trump, or is it going to be Citizen Zuck, the most powerful publisher of content since uh, William Randolph Hearst? Probably much more powerful than any newspaper tycoon uh, in history. There's going to be a collision there. Watch this space, it's already beginning. And I do not know, because I really can't predict it, how it will how it will turn out. One, one final thought. Although I'm a network kind of person, I always hated hierarchies from school onwards. And the more hierarchical the hierarchy, the more I hated it. My brief encounter with army life as a cadet in the Glasgow Academy Combined Cadet Force was a horrible experience about which I still have recurrent nightmares. <laughs> I actually became an academic when I realized that there was no hierarchy in academic life uh, in practice, uh, although there might be one on paper. Although I'm a kind of networks person, I don't think you can run the world on networks. And the vision of a world run on networks is in fact a nightmare vision. So I conclude with a kind of appeal for at least some hierarchy in the world. There has to be some hierarchy in the international order. Uh, and that's why I point out that, although you're right, there is potentially a dualistic world of China v. the rest, there's also a world in which China and the United States sit with three other powers, Russia, France, and this country, in a special place, the United Nations Security Council, first amongst equals, permanently in a position of power over other states, so the great powers live, and another scenario, which I prefer to yours, is one in which increasingly those great powers realize that whatever the problem, whether it's cyber warfare, or potentially biological warfare, or nuclear proliferation, or climate change, they either hang together or are hanged separately. And that's the way I conclude the book, with a kind of appeal to, to hierarchy. So. I think there is a tremendous amount there for us to uh, digest this evening. I will say that you really don't know what powerlessness is, Neil, until you've been head of department at a uh, British uh, university. <laughs> I have. I've watched. And uh, I think that's one thing that you did manage to get away from during your time in the, in the UK, and right, rightly so. We have now a very large and I think very lively audience here this evening at the Emanuel Centre, and we have microphones, I think, going around. So could I please see any hands from the audience with questions? Uh, please make them concise and proper questions, if you could, to Neil Ferguson, and we'll pass them on and get his opinions. I'm going to take two or three at a time just to make sure that we get plenty in. You choose we have a number which... one over there. We'll start with that. And there's a three over there, and I see. A, there must be a two and somewhere. And a two. And, yep, okay, well, we'll start left. with one, two, three, since they're there. Splendid. Go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. Is there a tendency towards groupthink with networks? Very good, very concise question. Thank you for that. Group think. Uh, number two, right on the other side of the hall. Go ahead. Yeah, just uh, picking up on Professor Ferguson's last point. Do you think networks generally are um, corrosive of democracy in that they're not accountable, or are they actually very democratic, or can they be uh, both at the same time? 
Excellent. And let's take a third one and then go to the uh, uh, go to go back to Neil. Where's um, number three? Thank you very much. Yep. Yep. Um, do the size of networks uh, have a particular importance? As in, the smaller the network, the greater the premium of the network. The people inside it can organise themselves better. They can know each other. They can activise as well more effectively. So, for example, in the 19th and 20th century, the labour movement, the feminist movement, the gay rights movement. All these networks, so to speak, faced intense hostility by the bigger network, the bigger hierarchy of the culture. But because they were smaller and more organised, they could win in the end. Great questions, uh, each and every one. I'll take them in order. Groupthink is uh, a great uh, term here because one of the characteristic features of large networks that I mentioned was the tendency for them to self-segregate into clusters the idea that we'll all just be one big global community is fanciful because in practice what is happening on these large networks is a self-segregation, usually along ideological lines. One can see this in some recent work that's been done on Twitter. People who use Twitter and retweet tweets tend only to retweet things with which they are ideologically uh, sympathetic. And so we have these extraordinarily uh, far apart clusters of, of retweets, liberal retweets there and conservative uh, retweets there. And the result of that is, be because of the way these platforms work, we find ourselves in echo chambers because the algorithm keeps sending us things that it expects us to like and agree with. So groupthink is endemic in large social networks. It's really one of the most unhealthy aspects of the the networked world. Uh, and this encourages something that we all have innately, which is our confirmation bias. Uh, once you've taken a position, uh, you start wanting evidence that supports it rather than evidence that contradicts it. The true scientist, as Karl Popper long ago argued, is looking for the opposite. He wants to have his hypothesis disproved, but we're only human. We'd rather have the hypothesis proved. So the networked world encourages confirmation bias in a way that is really quite frightening. And this leads on to question two. These networks and democracy, they matter hugely for the democratic process. I argued this evening, and I mean it, it decided the outcome of what happened in the United States last year, and I think it also decided the outcome of the Brexit referendum. It was actually Dominic Cummings who pioneered the use of targeted Facebook advertising to hone the message of the Leave campaign. Would you say Dominic Cummings is one of the major political strategists involved on the Brexit side? I think he was the genius, if that's the word, of Brexit. And he was the one who understood that you needed to use these tools to craft the message, to find out what worked, and then to bombard the key voters with it. Facebook data allow you to do that. Facebook data, if you can get them, allow you to exactly target your message uh, down to the postal code. So I, I think, well, beyond the postal code, down to all the personal traits of individuals that Facebook has been given by you all. Because you gave Mark your data for free. That's what you did. On the other side of that spectrum, actually, Neil, people have analysed that the, uh, the left-wing side, uh, the Jeremy Corbyn Labour Party, actually was much better in the recent British general election at using Facebook data than the Conservatives. Fact. Jeremy Corbyn has four times as many Twitter and Facebook followers as Theresa May or Boris Johnson. Four times. Now, that is a bigger margin of advantage on social networks than Donald Trump had over Hillary Clinton, and his advantage was pretty big. So this, for our democracy, has enormous implications because I think it makes the probability that Jeremy Corbyn will be the next prime minister much higher than anybody in Manchester appeared to realize, or maybe they did realize, this week. Incidentally, isn't it lucky that these letters up here are projected so there's really no danger that one of them will fall off and turn me into Eel Ergerson. And keep drinking the water, Neil. We don't want your voice to give out either. Yes, I'm going to try not to descend into helpless coughing. Uh, finally, <laughs> and nobody's, I hope, going to give me an unemployment slip. <laughs> no, you're okay that for the next 20 minutes, awkward, Neil. Awkward, wouldn't it? Um, size. So size, I forget where 
the person who asked, I think it was does so size matter? Uh, over the uh, side, I think. Yes. Uh, so size matters. Um, I think in the opposite way from the way you thought uh, or framed the question. Metcalfe's law. Metcalfe's law says that the value of a network grows with the size of the network. So the more nodes you can get to connect up, the more valuable the network is, which is why uh, he has, Mark Zuckerberg has furiously chased additional Facebook users. Getting to two billion was a major watershed. They're not finished. And why he's courting Xi Jinping, the president of China, so assiduously. Uh, to the extent of jogging through Tiananmen Square, which is an extraordinary... Without a gas mask. Without a gas mask, very hazardous thing to do. So Metcalfe's law, which actually was formulated with respect to telecommunications networks, it's almost a pre-internet idea, uh, says that a, a network is more powerful the bigger it is. And this is also illustrated by what happened to small exclusive networks when they tried to wield power. The Illuminati may be accused, as they were from the 1790s, of having caused the French Revolution. Actually, there were way too few Illuminati to do anything much, uh, and they were very easily closed down. They were a secret society. Membership never got even to 2,000. Uh, the irony of the whole conspiracy theory about the Illuminati is that it wildly exaggerates their power. Here's another example. Al-Qaeda looked like an incredibly effective network because it carried out the 9-11 attacks. And a tremendously uh, bright man, Valdis Krebs, was the first person to graph the network of the 9-11 plotters, a graph that I reproduce in the book uh, because it's through his work that Muhammad Atta was, a, uh, was a, uh, identified as the key 9-11 plotter. But you may have noticed that after that, they didn't really achieve a whole lot. Uh, and that was because the network really could only do that thing once. Uh, it was too small. It had been designed to be kept relatively small uh, in order to maintain secrecy to do repeated large-scale attacks. Whereas Islamic State, which is sought to be a big network and constantly trying to grow itself, uh, not only on the ground but online, is actually a much more formidable Foe. So I think uh, small networks, although they're nice to belong to if you're elected to, I don't know, the apostles in Cambridge, you probably feel really rather important. Which was a secret society that uh, engendered a lot of spies in 1930s Britain. Well, there, there were some other people who weren't spies, who were brilliant. A few of them. Uh, like, <laughs> let's, let's not be too Oxford here. Uh, <laughs> they were all at Cambridge, I should add. All right, let's be Oxford. So one of the fun parts of the book is the story of the apostles, a tremendously exclusive and more or less not that secret but somewhat secret, at least mysterious society of intellectuals uh, in Cambridge, which produced amongst other people, John Maynard Keynes, Lytton Strachey, both were members. But in the 1930s, this very exclusive network was thoroughly and successfully penetrated by the KGB. Uh, the Cambridge spies included at least three apostles. Uh, and this is another illustration of the problem with small networks. Maybe the problem with networks generally. They're not very good at defense. Uh, so the Russians have a long history of penetrating other people's networks. They did it last year to both the Democrats and the Republicans, let's not forget. And that, that I think, is a really important thing to bear in mind. So no, I don't think small is beautiful for networks. Let's take another round of questions. I, we have noticed that the questions so far have all come from the distinguished men in the audience, and we know that uh, both sexes are represented here. So, could we please make sure we have... There's a lady with her hand up right there. Very good. Okay, could we get a number and a mic to the lady there as well? And we'll take another we'll get a microphone three questions. To that lady um, there. So, as maybe one of the token Americans in the audience, you talked about the networks that are controlled by individuals in the U.S. and the ones that are controlled by the governments in uh, China. Um, you also just mentioned the Russians and their involvement. And I think it's a para paraphrasing of what he said, but Putin recently made a statement about those who control these networks, meaning the internet, uh, this kind of technology, control the future. So I would just wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you see the Russians' role in all of this, because they obviously have had a big impact, but there's also a lot of focus on it at this point in time. So, thanks very much. Great question about the Russians, madam. And we'll get a couple more um, points in as well. Do we have another number going on there? Yes, number one. Okay, go ahead. Yes, I was just wondering if you think um, networks have become more fickle 
in this day and age, it's very easy to follow and unfollow someone on Twitter and if that's had any more significant behavioural impact on society. Thanks very much. Excellent question. Let's take one more in this round. Again. Number two, right here. Go ahead. You said earlier that smaller networks are not as powerful and um, that they don't achieve so much. But wouldn't be, let's see, the East German Revolution when the East German state came down, wouldn't this be an example of smaller networks starting off like in Leipzig around the Nikolai Church? They started off and then it basically spread out. So that small network achieved quite a bit, didn't it? We should explain, that was the network that eventually became the German demonstrations against the communist exactly. government in 1989, yeah. leading ultimately to the fall exactly. of the Berlin Wall. Exactly, they started off at smaller networks in smaller cities around churches, and then they connected to each other, but they were not massively connected previously because it was too dangerous. Indeed. So again, three excellent questions, Neil. Terrific questions, thanks. Uh, Putin has a problem. Uh, in fact, he has a whole bunch of problems. <laughs> Uh, problem one is uh, what looked like a brilliant psychological warfare operation, the meddling in the US election has backfired massively on him so that relations between the US and Russia are at an, an all-time post-Cold War low. <laughs> Lindsey Graham remarked that it took some real genius to unite Republicans and Democrats in Congress <laughs> uh, and they were united over tightening sanctions on Russia. Problem two is you know, Russia's just not big enough to build its own competitive network structure. It does have them, uh, but they don't have the kind of critical mass that, that China has. So he's right to identify that he who controls the networks will control the 21st century. It won't be him. The, the Russian networks basically uh, outside of Russia subsist for nefarious activities. So if you get booted off, the, uh, the West Coast, the Silicon Valley networks, then you end up going to the Russian networks to do whatever skullduggery you have in mind. And so the dark web is, is partly a Russian, a Russian venture. But here's the trouble. In the, uh, in the world of, of cyber warfare, which is an extraordinarily important part of our story that we haven't touched on, the ongoing constant conflict on the internet between states and non-state actors and companies, in that world of cyber warfare, up until now, the Russians have essentially behaved like poachers. They have been, to put it crudely, outside the tent, uh, running with the bad boys. Uh, the problem about that is that Russia really is as likely to be hit by cyber warfare as any major state. Uh, and it was, uh, to my mind, uh, deeply satisfying to read that the WannaCry malware had infected more computers in Russia than any other country. And I think at some point Russia is going to have to recognize that it cannot simply be the renegade of the great powers running around with the bad actors on the internet. It has to recognize its common interest in having some kind of order in cyberspace and not what we have at the moment, which is a kind of anarchy or permanent state of war. Just to say, Neil, the WannaCry was an, an attack, a cyber attack earlier this year against software of bureaucracies of many countries, including this one, thought to have originated in Russia. Uh, well, or, it, it, or maybe it's not. probably not, actually. It was actually a morphed US uh, piece of software, we think, uh, which essentially infected people who hadn't updated their operating systems and locked them out of their of their hard drives. And the Russians, uh, who, if you go to Russia, don't necessarily always have uh, the best of software. Mm. It's a little bit like the NHS, only it's a country. Uh, <laughs> we're affected almost as much as the NHS. And also um, most of its most effective employees are foreigners. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> As Ed they have a lot telling. in common. I can say this kind of thing because my father worked all his life for the National Service, National Health Service, and often drew a parallel uh, between it and the Soviet Union. <laughs> At least it didn't have nuclear weapons. Um, so networks as fickle, uh, this is a really important point. Uh, the nightmare, if you're Mark Zuckerberg, is in the following uh, data. In the demographic under 30, more and more uh, young people in the United States are using Snapchat in preference to Facebook. Uh, and that must worry him almost more than 
the Russia inquiry and all the attendant scandal because if there were large-scale defection by young users, then Facebook's future would start looking a lot less uh, bright. Uh, so yeah, the system is fickle, but the following is true in all of these different networked markets. Winner takes all, or winner takes nearly all. Uh, Eric Schmidt puts this, um, the chairman of Alphabet, the parent company of Google, in the following way. It's Zipf's law, Z-I-P-F, Zipf's law. Uh, and in Zipf's law, the winner gets 90%. Some people get 9% and the rest get 0.9%. Uh, and so at the moment, Facebook's the winner take all, just as Uber seemed to be the winner take all. Uh, in the uh, ride-sharing contest, but that can change. MySpace looked like it would win social networking. MySpace was invented before Facebook, but its lunch got eaten. So yeah, it's, it's a fickle, volatile world. And one argument that is often made by these big network companies when they are accused of being monopolies is competition is just a click away. And that's become the standard defense against the antitrust uh, suits that some people talk about bringing against these companies. Finally, I'm very glad you asked about the revolutions of 1989. I was in uh, Germany in 1989. And you have to remember two things. One, all networks, by definition, start small. Facebook was just a bunch of Harvard students initially. The key thing is not the starting size, it's the rate of growth. And the rate of growth of the crowds in Leipzig was exponential. I know this because I did the, did the numbers uh, for a book I wrote, uh, I think it was Civilization. Uh, I even have friends who were there in, in Leipzig, a good journalist friend of mine was there. And he said that the scary thing at the beginning of the Leipzig protests, he was an early member of the network, was that the East German uh, security forces were there with weapons and they were deeply afraid that the, uh, the East German regime, Honecker's regime, would give the order and there would be Tiananmen Square in Leipzig. Uh, but because it grew very rapidly, exponentially, uh, in those few months, uh, there came a point when that was no longer a viable option, especially for a regime that had essentially been told not to do it by Gorbachev. I revisit the story of 1989 in this book. Uh, 1989 was in some ways the best year of my life. I look back on it uh, and I still, I still marvel that I was there and witnessed the disintegration of the Berlin Wall that, that year. I wasn't there on the night that it actually came down. I was there during the summer. I even wrote a piece with the title, The Berlin Wall is Crumbling because I was observing so many people crossing over into West Berlin from other East European countries where the travel restrictions had been loosened, like Poland. But the, uh, the newspaper that I sent it to refused to publish it. <laughs> uh, and the editor, this was communicated to me by the deputy editor, he said, well, Neil, the editor feels you've been listening to too many Ronald Reagan speeches. <laughs> so my piece, my prophetic piece, was never published and is lost to posterity because it was only on a little tandy, which had a memory the size of a gnat's memory. In this book, I look at the way that networks of dissent formed in the country that was much more important than East Germany, namely Poland. And there's some terrific work on this by a Polish scholar who's graphed all and reconstructed all the different networks that preceded Solidarity and shown how it was that solidarity for a brief but crucial period was able to join together all the different dissident forces which ranged from the right, devout Catholic nationalists, to the left, liberal-leaning academics and intellectuals. So that illustrates the point well. Poland got critical mass of dissident networks first and it was there that, that communist rule first folded. Thank you, Neil. And we've got uh, another round of questions now, and I see hands and numbers coming up there uh, too. Okay, let's, let's not necessarily do them in order. We've got a four over there. We want to make sure different parts of the hall get taken up. So four, let's take that one first and then make sure we go around. Hi, thanks very much. Um, so I wonder how you think that we can utilize this understanding of networks, specifically the Silicon Valley kind of network, 
to combat rather than encourage Islamic terrorism? Okay, that's a very good question. Thank you for that. Uh, let's see, is there a number that... Yes, we have a number three on this side. Let's get number three. Oh. Go ahead. Um, how do you think about the relationship between hierarchy and regulation, and what do you think is the most appropriate way to regulate networks? Very good question. Thanks for that. And let's... Uh, there's another four, but it's way over the other side now, so that's good. Let's get that four. Hi, you spoke earlier about the hierarchy and the network. I was wondering if you had an opinion on how the network seems to almost need a hierarchy. So if we look at, for example, uh, Wikipedia and how originally it had uh, no editors before becoming uh, uh, an organization with editors and almost uh, peer-driven, or Facebook, which now has groups and group admins and various other levels of hierarchy within its tools. So the last two questions, both very good questions, almost related to each other, and then the question, of course, about Islamic terrorism, Neil. Well, let me start with uh, the question on, on Islamic terrorism, and not only terrorism, but the, the non-violent Islamic extremism, which I think is a precursor uh, of, uh, of violent action. Uh, my wife, Ayan Hersi Ali, has written uh, an important analysis of this, showing how dawah, proselytization, mm -hmm. is the prelude to jihad. At the moment, we're doing a pretty terrible job of this in two respects. One, the, the networks have not been very effective at preventing their use by groups like uh, Islamic State. And Islamic State, I describe this in the book, in fact, I show a network graph of Islamic State's uh, blogging presence in 2013, prior to the, the high-profile executions that suddenly got everybody's attention the following year. And it's clear that Islamic State continues to be able to function, even on major platforms, by playing whack-a-mole with uh, the companies. You close down one account and another one opens. And there isn't, in fact, a good way of dealing uh, algorithmically with the way these people operate. And this relates to the second and third questions I'm going to talk about. Worse still, what has happened in the last year or so has been that those who speak out against Islamic extremism are attacked online relentlessly and viciously and accused constantly of Islamophobia. And this brings me to the questions of hierarchy and regulation and whether or not networks need uh, hierarchy and indeed regulation. And the answer is they clearly do. They clearly do. The problem is how exactly do we regulate platforms with two billion users generating vast quantities of content that are clearly beyond any human editorial control? At the moment, we have seemed to have reached a consensus in the United States that these platforms are not publishers. They are network platforms, and they continue to be regulated differently from publishers of content under the 1996 uh, Communications Decency Act. This exemption means that people at Facebook, or for that matter at Google, are not responsible for what appears on their platforms. There's no liability, there's no responsibility to warn. This exemption puts them at a great advantage relative to conventional publishers who have those uh, liabilities under the law. This is an anomaly. It must, I think, ultimately change. If it doesn't change, we are going to arrive in a situation at which publication is essentially monopolized or near monopolized by the Silicon Valley companies who will claim to have no responsibility for what is published. And then when we scream and shout, as the European Commission does, and says, but you're publishing terrible things, they will scramble, hire fact-checkers and editors, and put up a show of trying to suppress whatever they're told is hate speech. This is a completely dangerous path to go down, by the way, because I think the European Commission is giving even more power 
to these platforms by telling them effectively to be censors on our behalf. That seems to be the German government's line. I find it extraordinary. But I think we ultimately need to recognize that we haven't solved this problem. We're nowhere close to solving it. Uh, and I think that this will be one of the major challenges, not only in the United States, but in Europe, indeed everywhere in the free world. How do we regulate such vast networks that have never existed on this scale before? If we don't regulate them, they clearly have power beyond the imaginings of the most powerful press baron, as well as all the advertising revenue in the world. The two companies, Google and Facebook, got 90% of all new online advertising in the fourth quarter of 2016. If you're not in that business, if you're in the conventional publishing business, you are dying at this point. So we haven't figured this out, and that's partly what motivated me to write this book. This is a huge problem, and we don't know what to do. Democrats say, let's break them up. They're monopolies. Let's do antitrust, like progressives used to do. And that doesn't get very far, because they're natural monopolies. How do you break up Google? It's not conceivable that you could have a sort of balkanized search engine, Google Arkansas. <laughs> it's not going to happen. But if that's not going to happen, then I think there's some very hard thinking to be done about what regulation these should be given. They are utilities. The Supreme Court, Rana, recently said they are the public square, mm. which was good for me since I'd called my book already The Square and the Tower. This is the public square, but who owns it? A very potent question with which to leave the discussion for tonight. We could go on, we probably ought to go on for even longer, but the clock is defeating us. Before we finish the formal part of the evenings, though, I think we should acknowledge that we've had a tremendous range of discussion, not just on an immensely intriguing historical phenomenon, the question of hierarchies, networks, and how they're related, ranging from the Illuminati and the uh, Reformation all the way through Henry Kissinger to the present day, and also a variety of reflections, some of them optimistic, some of them frankly alarming, about where we may be going. There are very few, if any other, historians who could put this together, but Neil Ferguson is clearly very much one of those. We should thank him and Intelligence Squared who have brought us here tonight and reminded that the book will be available for signing in the foyer immediately afterwards. Neil Ferguson, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thanks.